an, ad an address, no slides. You will see something appear behind me occasionally during while I talk, but um, I'm not using those slides. Um, I, will, I will say the words that are on them, but they're quotes. So I'd like to start by saying thank you to those of you who made it here in person to our Enterprise Architecture Practitioners Summit and those of you who are out there on live, um, online, those of you who registered and those of you who are there on LinkedIn Live. Great to have you here. I never thought I'd say this, but it's actually great to be back on a stage again. It really is. It's nice to uh, see people. Nice to see people. And I have so many positive things to share with you about the open group and our community. But before I do, I'm sure, like mine, your thoughts and prayers are with the people of Ukraine right now. Um, the number of deaths, injuries, destruction of cities, towns, the widespread displacement of people is unsettling and unnerving for everybody. And I think we're all trying to come to terms with the fact that it's a reality in the 21st century. And meanwhile, the people in Ukraine have to endure the, the tragedy and the uh, suffering of this on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, we all hope, I'm sure, that there is a resolution to this in the very near future, because it's gone on way too long. And I couldn't have an event like this without at least uh, asking you all to, uh, to think that way. So, in the words of the American author, Tony Schwartz, let go of certainty. The opposite isn't uncertainty. It's openness, curiosity, the willingness to embrace paradox rather than choose up sides. It's important that we accept ourselves as we are but never stop trying to learn and grow. And these words not only hold great value today, but they're also a testament to reshaping and reassessing that we do in uncertain times. Even more so when we come back together, as we are some of us here today, whether in person or virtually. We've gotten used to the virtual events in the last few years. So in the last several years, we, we haven't had the chance to let go of certainty. It was taken from us whether we wanted it or not. And I think for the test for us as individuals and organizations is how do we respond and react in the face of uncertainty? Well, as the world shut down two years ago due to the pandemic, the open group kept growing and evolving. Together, we kept learning too. It wasn't easy. Let's face it, we're an organization that exists first and foremost to bring people together. And in 2020 and 2021, the last thing people wanted to do was be brought together physically or even allowed to in many places. Our other main raison d'etre is certification, most notably in recent years, certification of people. And that's hard to do when the test centers that people have to go to to take their exams to get certified are closed all over the world, sometimes with no notice. But how we, as an organization and a community, responded to these challenges is a sense of enormous pride for me. I'll tell you a bit about it. Our events team and supporting cast very quickly switched to purely virtual events. Many of you will have been at one or more of them. They were driven not just by the determination to overcome the, the challenges, the obstacles put in their way, but also by a genuine feeling that our community needed to be brought together even more than usual. The old adage that the show must go on was never more appropriate. Simultaneously, our certification team and supporting cast quickly focused on getting us the last part of the functionality that we needed in our systems to allow people to take their exams from home or remotely, including the safety and comfort of their homes. These actions were impressive in themselves, demonstrating, as they did, actually a great deal of organizational agility, a word on everyone's lips nowadays. Very important. However, 
What was just as important is the way our community responded. Yes, they did want to attend our virtual events, in record numbers, actually. And yes, they did want to get certified. In fact, many, of, many people told us that the pandemic presented an opportunity for them to focus on their professional development at a time when they didn't have to commute to work or travel for business or, or even pleasure, for that matter. They had some time. So, yeah, well done to all of you who took the opportunity to um, focus on personal development. And a huge thank you to every one of you who attended one of our events in the last couple of years. I'd like to think, as I stand here today, that we've helped each other through the uncertainty, at least as far as we've got so far. It's not over, as we know. But just as family sticks with you through thick and thin, we've really tried to stick with our colleagues, our members, our partners, all our customers. And you've all stuck with us. So thank you. Charles Darwin wrote, it is the long history of humankind and animal kind too, that those who learned to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. Appropriate, I think. Last year, specifically September 30th, 2021, the Open Group reached its 25th anniversary. In October, we celebrated with a um, non-stop 39-hour global event uh, with segments hosted in different cities around the world where we have offices. So we started in Shanghai. Uh, we moved on to Mumbai and London, um, Sao Paulo, San Francisco, Tokyo, and finally, oh, Johannesburg, and then finally Boston, Massachusetts. Apart from being a trip down memory lane, we were able to showcase some of the great achievements of this organization in the last quarter of a century. I obviously can't go over, over them all now. We took 39 hours to do it last time. So, um, but just a couple I'll pick out. How the Open Group originally developed and now evolves and maintains the TOGAF standard, which is the world's de facto standard for enterprise architecture. Indeed, I have an exciting announcement on that front at the end of my talk. Another little nugget from our history is the fact that the Open Group owns and is the certifying body for the Unix trademark and publishes the single Unix specification technical standard, which um, basically extends the POSIX standards. Now, all that may sound like a lot of techie talk to some, but let's put it in real terms. How many of you have ever used a smartphone? Good, the people here are awake. Please put your hands up at home as well, even though I can't see you. How many of you have lost track of time surfing the web? Site to site to site to site to site. Yes, yeah, I know you all have. And how many of you have ever played, this one you might not want to put your hand up, but ever, ever played a video game on a next generation console? Well, any of you have done any of those, you've used the Unix operating system or one of its derivatives. They're everywhere. So for me personally, when I look back at the, the 25th anniversary, it was, it was great to see faces old and new, well, sorry, faces familiar and less familiar would be better. Uh, yes, familiar, familiar and less familiar. Um, take time out of their day or night, whatever, whatever time it was, to, to join us in our celebration. And that wasn't possible um, without the hard and dedicated work of our members and staff, past and present. Thank you all. As Steve Jobs said, great things in business are never done by one person. They're done by a team of people. And the Open Group is a big team of people. So thank you. So before looking at more recent developments and a quick look into the future, uh, including the announcement I mentioned, I'd first like to tell you a story. Um, one that... Uh, describes how we've now got to the point where standards of the Open Group are fundamentally transforming industries across the world. And what follows is nicely summed up with another quote 
just to check the folks in the room are awake and you can see the quotes. So um, American anthropologist Margaret Mead. It's one I've always liked um, and I've found to be so appropriate for the open group. She wrote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. So our story, this particular story, starts not back in 1996 when the Open Group was formed by bringing together X Open Company Limited and the Open Software Foundation, but this story starts in 2010 with the formation of the Open Group FACE Consortium. FACE stands for Future Airborne Capability Environment. I was sure I was gonna get that wrong. FACE stands for Future Airborne Capability Environment. It comes from the federal avionics world, particularly in the United States. The issue being addressed by the Open Group FACE Consortium is how aircraft of all kinds, fixed wing, helicopters, unmanned, anything you wanna think about, aircraft of all kinds are procured by customers, most notably the US government. Traditionally, it's done by a very significant contract being awarded to a major organization who, whilst employing subcontractors along the way, they're basically given the task of designing, testing, building, and maintaining an aircraft from scratch. From scratch. Doesn't make any sense. So with increase, in, increased budgetary pressures and increased threats from overseas, some quite astute and, to be honest, brave people in the US Navy said, we can't do this anymore. <laughs> we can't keep starting from scratch. We don't have the money, we don't have the time. We've got to find a way to reuse technology, reuse skills that we have. We just can't do it the way it's been done. What they wanted to do was to take an open architecture-based approach to what they call the cockpit of the future meaning that the different functionality within that cockpit, say a communication system, could interoperate. So one communication system in one, one aircraft could interoperate with another, and it would be reusable. This just hadn't been possible in the past. So the face approach moves from everything being proprietary and one-off to everything being open, interoperable, and reusable. As I mentioned, this doesn't just save the customer a lot of money. It allows them to re reuse technology. Um, it allows them to reuse skills and expertise. And for the vendors, absolutely it changes the way things have always been done. It could be a threat initially. But it allows them actually to have more opportunities to bid on more contracts than they ever had before, as well as reuse their own skills and technologies. So one of the things that really made a difference between this initiative and previous attempts at standards like this in the federal avionics world, and there had been several, it was the fact that we in the open group, through our members, we haven't just addressed the technical challenges, we've addressed the business issues as well. The business issues underlying them that started this in the first place. So as well as creating the technical standard, we have been developing business cases and guides to procurement and other documents that mean that when a, when a procurement officer or a program officer either wants or more common nowadays is required to follow the FACE standard in their procurements, they can look on it, uh, they can look on it as, a, uh, as a, a useful tool for their job rather than another rock to fetch. We've got guides and information. This is how you do this. This is how you use it. It all helps the take up of the standards. The result is that the industry is fundamentally changing the way that the product's procured and for everyone's benefit. And already we've seen very significant procurements from various uh, US government service branches, which sends a clear message to the vendors that this is the way things will be done. This is the direction. And we not only want you on board, but we need you on board. But I would say the biggest differentiator of all is the open group itself. And the reason I say that is we've built up, originally maybe unknowingly, but quite deliberately ever since, 
this niche expertise of being able to bring together government and industry in a non-sales environment and have them work together on solving problems for the marketplace. That doesn't happen everywhere. It really doesn't. We hear it over and over. We've heard many times that this kind of neutral environment coupled with our tried and tested procedures and, and processes and our, our legal infrastructure, it makes for a safe, unique, in fact, safe harbor environment. So at this point, I'm sure many of you are thinking, well, it's great for federal avionics, but what's that got to do with me and my organization? I don't play in that space. Well, stick with me. The interesting thing that happened in this story is an organization completely outside that world, actually ExxonMobil, they heard what was going on in the FACE Consortium. And they very quickly identified that they actually had the same problem in the oil and gas world. So does, does this sound familiar? In the oil and gas world, their systems are um, basically put together by one major supplier from a fairly small list, and they may use some subs along the way, but basically they put the whole thing together, test it, build it, maintain it for like 25 or 30 years. I mean, imagine the security components in that 25-year-old system. So there's a lot, that needs to, uh, a lot that needed to change. And the result of the old way is that customers are tied into that system and tied into that vendor for a long time. So what, you know, we always start with a business driver. That's where, these, that's where the standards really have an impact. And that business driver, really, the main one in the oil and gas world, was their current generation of systems was reaching an end-of-life situation in the next five to 10 years. And they didn't want the next generation to be done the same way. We don't want to be stuck with the same old, same old approach for the next uh, quarter of a century. So essentially, they wanted for the oil and gas world what the US government had wanted for federal avionics. That is to say, open standards, open architecture, open systems-based approach. The truly smart thinking came when ExxonMobil decided they weren't going to just, having cottoned on to this, they weren't just going to keep it to themselves it would be far more impactful if they made it an industry play. So they came to us and said, can we do something around this problem for the oil and gas uh, industry, please? Very smart. So we checked with other operators in the oil and gas world, and have you got the same problem? And of course, they did. Indeed, we found out over the years in the open group that there's very, very rarely a unique problem that an organization has. These challenges, these problems are so often shared. And that's when it got really interesting because at that point we realized actually this wasn't just an oil and gas issue. This was a multi-industry issue. Basically, any industry that uses large scale process automation systems has exactly the same problem. So at that point, we're, in, you know, we're, we're talking about petrochemical, pharmaceutical, pulp and paper, food and beverage, oil and gas, obviously. All those industries, utilities, and others, they all have the same problem. And very quickly, organizations from all those industries were joining the open group to work together to solve these problems. And that's what became our Open Process Automation Forum. And they are doing fabulous work and continue to do so today. And the benefits are considerable for the customers, but also for the vendors. Because believe it or not, if you're a vendor and you've got a 25 to 30 year maintenance obligation, you actually can struggle to have the expertise to deliver on that or even have the parts. I had stories about strange places where parts were being bought from just to service these obligations. So, Lots of reasons um, for both customers and vendors why this is important. And like the FACE Consortium, our Open Process Automation Forum has focused on the business issues as well as the technical issues. So as well as the technical standards that they're working through um, at various levels and various depths on the standards, they're also working on business guidance and business case documents to help accelerate the take up of the standard. Of course, he wasn't talking about the open group, but he could have been when Michael Jordan said, Michael Jordan, former basketball player and businessman, uh, Michael Jordan said, some people want it to happen. 
Some wish it would happen, and some make it happen. Well, these guys are making it happen, and they're hap it's happening in the open group. The penultimate example I want to run through with you, and sorry if you're thinking, oh, God, that means there's at least two more, um, is our OSDU forum. That started as a group of operators and suppliers to them in the subsurface part of the oil and gas world. They had a fundamental business problem too. In their case, it was how they could access data. They spend, as I'm sure you might realize, gazillions, huge amounts of money on exploration, looking for where wells and other resources might be around the world, under the water, under the land, anywhere you can think of. But mostly due to the siloed nature of the way the data is generated, they can, they can only use a small part of the data that they gather. In fact, industry average is about 10%. Not really sustainable in another sense. Um, so um, what that forum is working on is getting all that data onto a cloud-based platform that will allow, to, allow them to analyze the data across the piece end to end and make far more use of it. It'll also provide the vendors in that world with um, the opportunity to provide specific value add services over those that they currently provide today. And it's fundamentally, again, like the other examples, changing from a single proprietor, pro proprietary single vendor approach to an open standards, open architecture based approach. And a key part of this initiative that makes this one a little different and is how we're evolving too, is it's taken, it's taken place simultaneously with a very substantial open source software development project. They're not just working on the standard, they're working on the code that implements it. The open group's not new to the open source world, but this was a first for us in dealing with a, hosting a project, open source project of that scale. Um, and it, because it literally involves huge numbers of developers. But what they've created is a data platform that is fully open source, cloud native, data centric environment for upstream. And it separates data from the applications and standards, um, it, it separates the data from the, from the applications and the standards and puts the data right at the center of the upstream community. It will also enable new cloud-native data-centric applications to have seamless access to the full range of subsurface and wells data that they now have on the platform, as well as supporting existing data frameworks and applications. So the OSTU forum has grown in membership very significantly um, since in the relatively short time it's been going. It's now our largest forum, in fact. And we have many of the world's top oil and gas operators and the suppliers to them participating, not to mention the major cloud providers that are pro providing the platform that all this will work on. That's new for the open group too. And we also, this year, in the same area, we, we brought in Energistics, which is a long-standing data transfer organization, consortium, in the oil and gas world. We brought them into the open group as an associate organization so that we were able to further capitalize on the synergies between the two organizations. In fact, the, the OSDU forum is now turning its attention to use, how to utilize the platform for the challenges of new energy. It's not just all about the traditional oil and gas. They can use it for, uh, for new energy too. Which leads me nicely to a separate but related activity, and this is the last one in the story so far. And that's the Open Group foot, um, Open Footprint Forum. You'll see a banner for it out in the uh, exhibitors area. And that is tackling the issue of the lack of common standards for measuring and reporting energy emissions. Why is this a problem? Well, currently, the lack of common standards for storing uh, defining and accessing greenhouse gas scope data, including CO2 and carbon. It has major business implications. Um, accurate data on emissions material and energy consumption is essential for mandatory compliance reporting and transparency, transparency reasons. And it's also key in 
taking action to avoid, reduce, and offset emissions, which is what the whole world wants. But organizations today face many significant challenges when it comes to managing their data footprints, including increasing requirements for reporting on all this stuff, uh, reliably, <laughs> importantly, um, both to customers, regulators, and society in general. Um, consistency in data measurement, compatibility, and interoperability throughout the supply chain. And a lack of standards for recording and processing environmental footprint data. So what's a real life practical example of that? Well, if you look at a supply chain where there are multiple organizations of, um, involved in that supply chain and the recipient at the end has to report on the energy footprint of all this stuff, well, it's almost impossible right now because every organization has used its own version of recording this stuff along the way. So, you know, it's, it's basically used data from its own standards. So what the Open Footprint Forum um, provides is basically an environment for one set of standards across all industries. For that, they will deliver uh, one flexible data platform, one set of data definitions, one set of metadata definitions, uh, one API to access the data, bringing multiple variants, just like we did with the single unit specification, multiple variants down to one. And having implemented a copy of the Open Footprint data platform, an organization um, uh, you know, can add together its, its, its energy emissions, its energy values in, in a consistent way, meaning that they're not spending time and money on all sorts of different things, and they can focus instead on applications that make, a, make better use of the data and create more business value and make a real difference um, in innovation and start tackling the problem of energy emissions head on in a consistent way. So it's more than just a set of standards. We're also gonna provide a reference architecture and again, an open source based reference implementation in that forum. This is big stuff um, and the world needs this. Uh, it will deliver basically a real time implementation that companies can implement in their own environment uh, resulting in a pretty much a fully operational setup. Now, they're not there yet. You can't go out and get this right now. They're still working on it and putting it together. This stuff doesn't happen overnight, but they've got a roadmap and they know where they're going. And it's not just the commercial world where our standards are having a huge impact in the way things are done. We have a great example in India um, where the Indian government has adopted a standard called NDA a couple of years ago now, I think. Um, and that basically, well, it's based on our TOGAF standard. And it basically is implemented by the government in a way that means any work, any enterprise architecture work done for the Indian government has to be done in conformance with that standard. And <clears throat> some of the states in India are now following suit, and they'll get there at different times. But, um, what it means is it creates a great opportunity for our ecosystem of trainers and consultants who supply into that market, um, who have the expertise around our TOGAF standard. And the hot off the press news is that the first state to really follow suit and implement the national standard, the state of uh, Meghalaya, has just been selected as a, ch as a champion project for the UN World Summit on the Information Society Prizes for this year. I mean, this was announced two days ago. Um, and there's going to be much more following along that, along that way um, in that area. All in all, the clear thread from one industry to another to another demonstrates that the Open Group has a pretty compelling story about bringing together customers, suppliers, even governments in different industries to solve fundamental different business problems using our standards. And as the business writer Simon Manmaring says, very appropriately. Effectively, without industry-wide industry collaboration, cooperation, and consensus, industry change is impossible. And that's what we do here at the Open Group. That's what we're all about. So that's that particular story. 
Uh, thank you for sticking with me. So far, there are going to be other examples, I know. But I'd just like to share, in the last few minutes I have, some examples of what's gone on in the open group since we were last together in a room. Um, we ended last year with 870 memberships from um, over, over 50 countries around the world. 870. So put that in perspective. It took us from 1996 to 2015 to get to the milestone of 500 members. And since then, in the six and a bit years since then, we've added 370. We've more than doubled our rate of growth in membership. And on the certification side, we're proud to uh, state that there are now nearly 120,000 individuals from 150 different countries countries certified under the uh, TOGAF 9 certification program. If you add TOGAF 8, it's a lot more too, but we're focusing on that one. That's a big number. And despite, I've touched on the virtual nature of our events, despite having to host those virtually over the last two years, we've had tremendous um, participation throughout. I mean, it's been, to be honest, humbling to see how many people are, are attending our events from all over the world, asking questions and all of this stuff. Over 6,000 at our quarterly events alone and 20, more than 25,000 individuals over the course of last year alone attended an open group event. It's big stuff. Makes me very proud. On the topic of events, uh, another uh, notable addition to our portfolio um, started last year has been our very well-received um, Toolkit Tuesday broadcast series. Um, we've had 17 episodes so far, uh, typically every two weeks. I think we had a bit of a longer gap over the uh, recent holidays. Um, but I'd like to have been very well attended. People are watching them uh, live, participating live, and um, at times more convenient to themselves as well because they're, they're recorded and available on demand. But um, I'd like to thank all the panelists and speakers that we've had uh, on those episodes, and particularly our resident panel of experts. You know who you are, and there's some in this room. Um, and most of all, though, I'd like to thank any of you who've attended those episodes. Um, and uh, don't worry, for this particular session, I'm not going to spend time saying the only way you can ask a question is to click on the three dots in the corner of the screen and ask it through the Q&A channel, not the chat channel which I do every other Tuesday. So you can look forward to that if you join the next one. So we don't need that today. But a quick look now, and then I'll stop, I promise, and get on with the other great speakers. Quick look now at a significant strategic initiative that you're going to be hearing more about from the Open Group in the coming months. And that's the portfolio of digital standards. So Rob gave me a great introduction uh, to that. He referenced that. It's, it's important to many of our members. And our digital open digital standards vision is to help businesses create customer value using digital and agile ways of working with the, with the intention for the open group of positioning us as the premier source of open standards for the digital world. For a couple of years now, we've been rolling out an innovative approach which is similar to the way industries develop digital products. It's something we call standards as code. And the emerging framework for um, open digital standards that, we're, that we've got is lowering the barrier for continuous update of content while still maintaining the same high rigorous standard and quality that people have come to expect from the open group. So the initial set of standards is a common vocabulary and roles, uh, digital competencies, provided by the Digital Practitioner Body of Knowledge Standard, or DPBOC, some of you may know it as that. The Digital Product Control and, and uh, Accountability from the IT for IT version three reference architecture um, uh, snapshot. And Architecting the Digital Enterprise, which is taken from our uh, Open Agile Architecture, or OAA standard, the TOGAF standard, and the Archimate standard. And the work going on in our security forum on zero trust architecture is going to be key to the digital enterprise too. So that, that will be kind of under, as security does, kind of underpinning everything. So 
the framework, why is it important? Why is it different? Well, it does represent a fundamental change in how we do things. We're going to be able to present our standards in a more unified manner that better reflects the way that they're actually used in the marketplace. That, that is together. You know, use the right standard for the right, the right task at the right point. So we believe that that will um, deliver one of the most cohesive and comprehensive approaches to organizations who are looking to capitalize and compete in the post-pandemic uh, post digital economy. Well, I could go on, such is the breadth. I've much more I could say, and I'm happy to share it with anyone uh, who's, who's here at any time, but we've plenty of other great stuff to get through. But I'll end here. Uh, thank you all very much for listening, both in the room and those of you joining us virtually. Um, if you have any questions, anyone in the room, about anything I've said or anything I might not have said, then come grab me over the next couple of days. Um, anyone else who's there virtually, if you have questions on this, then um, please uh, submit them, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll do my best to get them answered. So I started with a quote, and I'll end with a quote, one that's always resonated for me personally. And how I look at things. And it's from the uh, American author and poet, uh, Maya Angelou. And she said, my mission in life is not just to survive, but to thrive. And to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. Well, the more that I spend time at the Open Group and the people that make up this community, I think it actually applies across the piece very, very, very much. So we aren't just going to survive, we're going to thrive, and we're going to go on to great things. Thank you for listening, and let's keep learning and growing together. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. So I'll spit, switch back to more normal mode, the, the rest of the event. And I mentioned an exciting announcement, didn't I? A couple of times, may have missed it. We've been keeping this somewhat quiet, but being less subtle over the last few weeks as we've been getting closer to this. But um, I am, I am uh, delighted uh, and excited to announce um, the release of the TOGAF standard 10th edition. I mean, this marks a major milestone um, in the development of what I described earlier as, as the world's de facto standard for enterprise architecture, the most used standard for enterprise architecture. It's developed by the Open Group Architecture Forum, and uh, today's release introduces a refreshed modular format structure, which will make it easier to apply the TOGAF framework to different kinds of organizations and different styles of architecture. A lot of the new stuff is guidance. It's how to, we, how to do this, how do we do this? So the TOGAF Standard 10th Edition, so that you can all hear what the real name is, um, TOGAF Standard 10th Edition builds on over 25 years of development and constant input from the Architecture Forum's global community of EA thought leaders some of whom are in the room today. Um, it expands the material available, as, as I've said, uh, to architecture practitioners, and it makes adoption of best practices that are in there much easier. It's greatly expanded guidance and how-to material. It enables organizations to operate in an efficient and effective way across a broad range of use cases, including um, agile enterprises and digital transformation. We've been looking forward to this for a while, uh, for some time, and it represents a great deal of work from a great number of people over several years. So thank you to each and every one of you who contributed, and uh, we will, uh, you will be acknowledged with badges and other things in different ways uh, uh, in the coming, uh, coming weeks and months, but thank you very much for your contributions. And, um, 
We know this has been much anticipated by a lot of people, and you're going to want to hear more about it. So to start down that path and finally hook me off the stage, um, it's a great pleasure to introduce